do and then great so I'll, I'll go ahead and do the the introduction so thanks so much for being here kevin um so as you know you're joining me here today to talk about your experience um having had a traumatic brain injury all of the work that you're doing now uh with advocacy and then i've got questions from my class who are uh, in the set their second year of their master's program so about to be finished to become speech pathologists and to serve people like you and and others who have um, had brain injuries as an example and so they've got some specific questions that i'll ask you but first i'm hoping to just have you kind of share your your general experience with us and kind of give us the lay of the land before we we dive into some of the more detailed discussion awesome awesome yeah it's a pleasure to be here um, I remember, you know, speaking for your class in person um, I, last year, two years ago. I think it's about two years ago now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so my name's Kevin Ballister. I'm the, I wrote a book called How to Feed Your Brain. I don't have a copy with me right now, but, um, but yeah, so I'm a severe traumatic brain injury survivor and I'd like to uh, share my screen and kind of give you a little presentation about how how my story starts so let me see if i can do that here sure um all right so what i would do is share screen okay i think this will work okay and then um where's the play button here it is okay all right so the brain <laughs> this is what's <laughs> controlling everything, right? And the brain is so intricately um, complex with, with 86 billion neurons making trillions of connections all over. And actually what you're looking at here is actually my brain. Um, I had my brain scanned with high definition fiber tracking back in 2017 and um and this like outlines the groupings of neurons and axon fibers and um i'll show you a little something here let me see if i can pause it at just the right spot so here we go um this is the brain right here right down the middle of this this is called the central fissure and what what uh what we see here is two hemispheres and they should look pretty similar i mean clearly they're going to be differences but as far as looking at this they should look pretty similar um some things to note about my brain is first of all the left cerebellum over here and the cerebellum is super important and um that controls that it basically takes in input from all of our peripheral nervous system and our autonomic nervous system and it coordinates muscles to send that in, the the information that's important to the cortex which then sends it down to do something this includes swallowing this includes talking all of it you know it includes walking moving your hand all of the things we do um so so you can see my left cerebellum is frayed um it's it's definitely different than the right cerebellum here and uh that shows up in my function so a neurological test you do this as quick as you can this is as quick as i can do it on my left hand and uh, maybe i should show that well maybe i can I see it i can see it up in the corner i think we you can, can see it in the corner all right cool cool um and then you can also see in the right occipital lobe there seems to be some some matter missing some connections missing um and that's the occipital lobe that has to do with vision and uh we can talk about that later well we don't need to talk about that we're talking about speech and swallow we're, mainly so we're also interested in hearing about any changes that you noticed following your brain injury absolutely how much time you got <laughs> 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 all right so here's a bit about my story. So in 2011, this was me. I sustained a severe traumatic brain injury. I was insulin conscious, rushed to the hospital, put on life support. Um, while, while I was in my, a coma, my, my mother came and visited me. And, you know, the doctor came in and gave, gave the list of injuries that I had 
sustained. And those injuries include a bruised and swollen left eye, fractured right ilium, a fractured right sacrum, three cracked ribs on my left side, a nasal fracture, a lacerated left kidney. Both of my lungs were severely bruised. I also contracted infections, MRSA and pneumonia, which are both life-threatening. And then they scanned my brain as well. Bruised left frontal cortex, bruised left temporal lobe, and subdural hematoma. And later found out, I'm not sure if it's going to be on this slide, but uh, yeah, I also sustained a severe diffuse axonal injury. So I was comatose for 12 days. And, um, and then I woke up. And I woke up. <clears throat> And I looked awesome, as you can <laughs> see. And, um, you know, several months, whoops, let's, let's go through this again. There it was. And I'm going to show you some pictures of me in the hospital. This is going through. First of all, you can see I'm closing my left or my right eye. And it doesn't matter which eye I was closing. The thing is, I, I have double vision. So it's called diplopia. And basically, the when we look at something, the the we see two images, one with each eye, and our brain goes, okay, these are the same image, and puts them together. My brain doesn't do that as well. So the image I see with my right eye is lower than the image I see with my left. Um, but of course, that was the least of my problems at that point. So um, so going through recovery. We are in, in physical therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a wheelchair, but for my eye, I wore an eye patch, which makes a big deal. I, I switched it every like 20 minutes. I would switch it from side to side so that my eyes were evenly strong, you know, so they both got exercise. <clears throat> you can also see I have a tracheostomy. So I was breathing through to my neck. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, and you are likely working with with valves and things to actually speak <clears throat> at, at that point. The thing is, I couldn't even. I I had a uh, uh, occluded trachea, so oh, okay. so two two and a half centimeters of my trachea were were narrowed down to the size of a drinking straw. Oh, so wow. even when I tried to like pl plug it and force air through my my pharynx, um, I I wouldn't, it wouldn't work, you know. And it, it would I I could do it, but my face would turn bright red, and it just it wasn't happening. So what I learned to do was mouth my words, was really articulate with my mouth in order to so that people could read my lips mm. and that's really powerful thing to do so if you have a, if you have um patients who are unable to speak um and are unable to you know use a valve that allows them to speak getting them to fully exaggerate their speech so that they're talking in a way where you can see it clearly that's very very useful i found that to be very useful and i also want to say that i also work with clients who um who are recovering from a brain injury i work as a neurotrauma medical advocate neurotrauma medical advocate which is where i work with people who have have a loved one who sustained a brain injury and they're in the hospital setting or they require nursing um, assistance daily and what uh, and that's the neurotrauma side and and I help them navigate through the medical you know matrix as I call it the, the and, and get the treatments that are going to help them the most um, even within our current medical model and navigating through that the other thing and getting getting even when they're not the standard of care you know because the standard right. of care it's, it's, it's really good in one aspect in that it ensures a certain level of care, but it's also very limiting for doctors and, and therapists because they can't, and me, just medical professionals, 
because practicing outside of the standard of care makes you liable to be sued for malpractice. So I, I, I working with clients, there are ways around that. And with working with practitioners, there are also ways around that by getting the okay from, from the patients. Um, and I can talk more about that if you're interested. But w when it comes to uh, empowered neuro rehabilitation, that's when I work with clients in order to give, get them to recover as best they can. So I work with clients all over the world. I have a client in India I was working with mm -hmm. last night, their morning. Um, and, and we were working on, on some speech things, um, things like, like tongue twisters and enunciating uh, effectively. And um, I can talk more about that as well. But anyways, there, there I am with an eye patch and, and a tracheostomy. Hold on one moment. Sure, sure. Come here, puppy. Come here. Good girl. Come here. <laughs> and so let me ask you at this stage okay. when um, you were articulating and, and um, having people who were interact with you lip read, was there a possibility at that time for you to write as well your message? Yes. Did you use Very that as a strategy? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I, I work with clients who are not able to write mm -hmm. um, or where it's very difficult, you know, um, where like writing a sentence takes two minutes, you know, and, and luckily it was my left hand that was, is mostly affected by my cerebellum being damaged. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and I'm right handed. So I still had that. Um, still I'm, that. Okay. I'm, I'm working with a client right now who has a very similar thing going on, but it's his right side that's that's uh, a toxic. I see. And his is and his writing is very it's very difficult when you're not getting the the information to your cerebellum to coordinate the muscle out. Um. So, so yeah, the, the, that's, that's at this point. Writing is, is huge if you, if you can do it, mm -hmm. awesome. Um, let's, let's keep going through this. I also um, had a peg tube. At one point, I, I had a nasogastric tube for a while and that, that's pretty annoying to have a tube out of your nose. <laughs> so it's a great temporary thing. Um, and it, it's interesting. My mom was so like, like, don't give him a peg to, don't do a surgery to put it in. It's really not that big deal getting a, a peg tube. It's, it's pretty, you know, it is invasive, but it's pretty, you know, pretty standard. They can just poke a hole in there, put a tube in, and it makes things so much easier. Working with clients, I find it, I, I love it when they, they have a peg tube for several reasons. Um, I also do a lot with nutrition, mm -hmm. um, right? My, my book's called How to Feed a Brain uh, because nutrition played a huge part in my recovery and getting nutrients into people um, is a lot easier when we're, we can bypass the right. swallowing mechanism. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, uh, that being said, swallow, food is so important, you know, yeah. eating is so important. I, I, I didn't eat, walk or talk for months, eat, eat conventionally that is. Um, and I, I, I wrote this in my blog, but primal instincts override rationality at that point. And like, I would have traded being able to eat for being able to walk, you know, if I, if I could have a delicious meal, <laughs> but I'd never be able to walk again, I totally would have taken it. Um, I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad right. I right. It, it just, it just not, now I got it all, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's so important. And um, I actually want to tell a quick story about when I was, 
going when uh, an experience with a speech language pathologist that was not favorable there was, it was it was a yes, beginning and so, uh, and so i'll say that one of the questions that came up from many yeah. of the students um includes wanting to know kind of throughout your recovery so right afterwards all the way through um what were the things that were really great that speech pathologists did and what were the things that they didn't do so well like what are things that you would advise us against doing perfect yeah um one thing that that speech pathologists do very well is um is I guess a lot of it being almost cognitive, you know, like, like the cognitive rehab stuff. Sure. Um, I, I really appreciated a, a, so much of that. And I actually stayed with my, with, uh, her name's Catherine Hayes. She's in, um, in, where is it? Dripping Springs. Okay. And, um, and she's, she's fantastic. And I was, I had my my speech back and I was pretty happy with it. I mean, still very much mistaken for being drunk all of the times. Um but she she was just great and we were working on on getting my speaking really um really solid because for my speaking career for, right. for my presentations and actually being on stage and speaking effectively. So that's that. That's something that I continued to do for for several years um, when I was up and walking, talking out of the hospital, and, and right. giving presentations on stage. You know, because I found so much value in that. Right. Um, one of the things that uh, that is pretty upsetting is you know you the speech language pathologists hold the keys to whether I could eat again. You know. And as I said, it's it's being able to eat conventionally is so important. I mean, eating is so natural for for humans. We do it socially. We food's a big deal, right? At least it is to me. You know? I, I completely agree. Yeah, and <laughs> when you're not <laughs> able to eat, it's like it's maddening. I um. I'll tell a little secret that I haven't really put out there too much, but I used to um, sneak an extra bottle of, of boost, which is like the terrible um, liquid formula they fed me through the peg tube, but I'd actually sneak that and I'd hide it under my bed while I was in the hospital because it wasn't enough nutrients. And I would, I would practice swallowing with that and my my speech language pathologist would like her hair would fall out if she heard about <laughs> it but um but yeah i was i was practicing a little bit and there was a time when and and she explained the risks of like if i aspirate that and i get sugar in my lungs um it's not good you know is right. uh, there's there's risk of infection of pneumonia it could be life threatening right so oh, i but but he was like having something in my mouth like eating something was so important and i did have a speech pathologist who um allowed me to do trials with ice chips okay to, to try to do that because if i aspirated ice chips it wasn't the end of the world it was water it's like but I, I started it, um, they call it silent aspiration, mm -hmm. you know, where I wouldn't cough, right. um, even though I was aspirating. And, uh, and that made it really dangerous to do any of it. At least that's what they said. They were like, no, no ice chips for you. And that, that, that might have been why I smuggled you know, <laughs> an extra boost. Um, yeah, so... So the other thing is when um, when I could eat. Um, so so at one point I went to see. I had a throat surgery done, which resectioned my trachea. Okay. Essentially, the occluded section. They saw it on either side of that occluded section, pulled that out, sewed the two ends back together, and now I I could breathe through through a 
trachea that wasn't swollen up. Right. And, and I was able to talk at that point. And then I, uh, but I still wasn't able to eat. And so I, I scheduled a, a meeting with um, Tamar Kotz, who is the speech and swallow um, doctor in uh, at Mount Sinai and went and saw her and she was just about to leave for vacation. And she said, and it's so funny because I was just writing about this. Like <laughs> it was, it was like nine years ago, last month or whatever. Um, and she, and I'm doing an anniversary posts where I write about what happened, oh, great. you know, nine years ago. Great. Um, and so, yeah. And so you can see those on, on adventures and brain injury, or you can see those on my adventures and brain injury page, my Facebook page, feed a brain page. It's not always on feed a brain, but I always post them on adventures and brain injury. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, so Tamar Cotts, I, I contacted her and, um, and, uh, and she was like, I don't know why you're coming to see me, you know, but Brett Miles, who was the surgeon who, who resected my trachea, um, asked me to see you and uh he's like uh, i'll i'll do anything for him and and i will too he's he's slit my throat to save my life you know <laughs> so uh <laughs> so i um so I went in and i'm like i gotta eat something like like i can i think i can swallow she's like well i'm not set up to do a whole like barium swallow test with you right now but what I can do is I can, I can, you know, feel your, your, um, your pharynx. Pharyn yeah. I think I said larynx or pharynx before and I meant larynx. That's okay. Um, okay yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, she's like, I can feel your pharynx and see if it's, if you're swallowing appropriately based on feel, but it's not like I can't sign off. Um, and I'm like, I, so we did that and she's like, you know what? Yeah, I think you can have, uh, you can do trials, you know, and, and eat something for, for, was it quality of life or something like that was what she said. And, um, and that was great. So I would, I would eat something and then I would get the rest fed through the, the peg tube, um, which, which is great. And I use that with my clients also it's like you know you're not really at a point where you can get enough nutrition sure. eating orally so it's it's nice and it's nice to have a peg tube instead of a nasogastric tube because right. that thing's annoying you know um <laughs> and uh yeah so she was great and then after that i had a visiting nurse come and she was like nope you can't you can't have anything and i was like tamar Cotts said i could and she's like it doesn't brett miles said you couldn't and there was a, the whole this whole like back and forth and that that's something that um that was and she was she was new and i contacted tomorrow later and we figured it out but tamar was like yeah a lot of the times um, new SLPs are very nervous to allow anything, you know, because of liability and like, sure, sure. um, and that makes, that makes sense. But it's also, you know, there's, there's a therapeutic zone and, and there's a, we call it you stress and distress. Distress is when you, you practice something, but you go beyond your, your therapeutic threshold. Um, so, so it's like lifting weights. Like if you try to lift an inappropriate amount of weights, you're going to like drop the barbell on you. Sure, and sure, crush sure. Your chest, right. So, but if you're lifting an appropriate amount, you get stronger because of it. Mm -hmm. So as far as swallowing, same thing, you know, we, we want to practice swallowing safely and, and that's where, um, you know, you're, you, so this this uh this speech pathologist i forget her name we'll call her mindy but uh she was like it started with an m but it doesn't matter <laughs> um but she was like she was very much like i'm here to give you the rules 
and not to help you swallow really not to really talk to you and get your buy-in and and that sort of a thing as well right yeah yeah so so yeah i didn't like her okay um and i did make a video for slps that i I saw that i saw that yeah yes Mm -hmm. right yeah Happy to, to share that with you guys as well. Yes, it's, thank it's you. On YouTube. You, you can watch it anytime anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on, on the Adventures in Brain Injury uh, YouTube channel. And so, uh, so yeah, I didn't like her because she was, she was so like scared to do anything to progress me. And therefore it was holding me back so so there's a balance right Mm -hmm. you don't want things to be dangerous and you don't want to um be tiptoeing too much and and not um not progressing your patients sure sure that's really great advice and and when you were in the hospital above and beyond the swallowing component was a speech pathologist working with you in any other kind of manner or was it only restricted to the swallowing? Let me think. I think at first it actually it wasn't speech, so it was swallowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um okay. first we we weren't doing anything speech wise. Right. And le- later, like basically when I could um swallow and as I was saying when when my uh my um speech and swallow doctor said and i don't know if it's an ear nose throat doctor or or what i have to look at notes but um but when she said yeah you can do some trials um and and then the the visiting nurse speech language pathologist was like no you can't um that was she was working on on vocal stuff on voice I which see. i hadn't had much at um so it was, it, and all that was on my mind at that point was, I want food, you, want, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. and I don't like you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and sitting across from a speech language pathologist who's not letting you eat and who you don't like. Exactly. Um, and they're like, all right, now say this. It's like, yeah. yeah it was, you're, you're not going to have any buy-in at I didn't that want, point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you're not getting buy-in and, and and honestly when you put in a dependent state like that right you revert to dependent tendencies and you turn into a two-year-old in many in many ways you know (laughs) so and it's not it's not anything uh anything bad or wrong and especially not something to make fun of or be like you're being a two-year-old it's just like of course you're being a two-year-old you're in a dependent state but you're gaining your your independence, independence you know right right and that's something i really saw with brain injury in general is that and really and other other debilitating conditions you know um or injuries is that it puts you in that dependent state mm-hmm. and you revert a lot to to earlier stages in life so mm-hmm. i've actually compared um compared recovering from a brain injury like growing up all over again only the difference is i could i had the frontal lobes to see and to understand what was going on and watch myself learning yeah which was a very cool place to be i imagine so, that it, it it could be very interesting but at the same time very frustrating very frustrating very yeah <laughs> Right on. Yes. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. And, and, and having, you know, a speech language pathologist talk to you like a baby um, yeah. when you have the wherewithal and, and, and having lots of people talk to you like a baby. I mean, it's been that way for quite some time, honestly, wow. because after my injury, um, I, I ended up, well, yeah, l- let me fast forward a bit in sure, the story. Sure. Um, to, well, you know, we'll get there. Um, do you have any more questions about this stage? Yeah. So I guess the one other question I had about thinking of thinking about pretty close to following your injury was whether or not you noticed kind of 
tell me about what other things you noticed in terms of changes. So you noticed obviously the change with vision, swallowing. What about cognitive changes? What were the things that you noticed early on? Nice. Um, so I didn't notice them at that point uh, because, because mm -hmm. you know, your brain is your organ of perception and my brain was damaged. So I couldn't even see myself not being able to see myself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting paradox. Um, and later, you know, as, as I uncovered what, what had happened and, and going through the medical records and understanding what would happen. And, and I'm so thankful that there was video, there was uh, text message um, history and like right. all of that so that I could decipher everything that happened and get a picture of what was, was happening in that time. Um, one thing that's, and the bottom line is I was in a brain fog you know, mm -hmm. and you can't see you're in a brain fog when you're in a brain fog because you're in a brain fog. Right. <laughs> and, so, and so I know we're going to be moving forward in time to kind of another, another stage following your injury, but if you had to give a, a kind of just a rough estimate of when you feel like you had some awareness about um, kind of the cognitive changes that that were present about how long did that take until you real you were really able to kind of see that so i get this question all the time <laughs> and it's not really a time thing mm -hmm. it's more uh uh for me it was a nutrition thing i see for me it was it was when i i healed my digestion i healed my blood brain barrier i began getting the nutrients that my brain needed to my brain and um, my book goes into that so mm -hmm. feed a brain will talk about how how that was done and um and what regaining clarity what what happens when your brain finally gets the nutrients that it needs because when you have a brain injury your brain your blood brain barrier is breached it's it's open, which means any toxins, inflammation, whatever in your body is easily able to cross your blood brain barrier, which inflames the brain, which reduces communication to the digestive system, which means that the digestive system becomes permeable, more permeable than it was, which is also very um, common with brain injuries, intestinal permeability. So, so, um, so, I mean, I know this is a nutrition thing. Should I go into intestinal permeability? I think, why don't we stick with the, the speech and language and cognition cool. side for now? And then if we have extra cool. time, certainly we can delve into that. Um, right. And so, uh, so in terms of kind of timeline then, we're thinking about when you had enough nutrition, you felt like is when you started to have that awareness. About how I long would you... Not just enough nutrition, the right kind of the nutrition. The right kind. Yes, and, the right and, kind of nutrition that healed my digestion. Okay. And healed my, my, my barriers. And how long after your injury do you feel like that kind of stabilized? So for me, let's see, that was about one and a half years. And I'm very lucky to have been steered in the direction see. to where I was able to heal my heal my digestion mm -hmm. because that's not part of the conventional medical model. Um, right. And so getting to a place where, where we are actually doing things from more of a functional medicine model and more of a, mm -hmm. more of a, um, you know, um, Eastern and, and Ayurvedic and all sorts of different practices that focus on the digestion, which is where, you know, which is where the nutrients that our body assimilates, that's where it starts. You know, that's the majority of the input uh, to our body comes, comes in through our, our digestive system, okay. you know, and our lungs, but that's gaseous. That's a whole different thing. But like the nutrients that, that build up our building blocks. I mean, we've all heard you are what you eat mm -hmm. and that's, that's true ish. 
more accurately, you are what your body is able to do with the food you eat. Mm -hmm. So if you're not absorbing the nutrients, then it's, 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 it's not, it's not building you. And in fact, if you're not absorbing the nutrients, it may be inflaming your body and causing immune response and all sorts of things. So, um, and so that was, you felt like that was a bit more stable about a year and a half after your injury. And that is when you noticed that you could really perceive the cognitive changes that had occurred. Okay. That's really helpful. That's when I I started perceiving. And that's actually when I started writing also. Okay. um, Is because I started to to regain some clarity. Mm. That's when when I was like, okay, there's something to nutrition. And I was in writing a book on nutrition at that point. I was writing about my experience so what Mm -hmm. what i did is on the anniversary of each important event of my brain injury i began to write about what happened the year prior um and and this was extremely cathartic for me it helped me to actually you know see what the 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 whole of of what had happened during this time that i had very little memory of Sure. And the memories I did have were foggy, were sure. foggy at best, you know? So, uh, That's and really helpful. I, I, yeah. yeah. And, and so moving then from more of the kind of acute phase when you were in the hospital, um, let's talk about what your recovery looked like once you were kind of discharged. All right. Let's, let's, let's go forward. Sure on this slideshow. Mm-hmm. So still still in the hospital. Um, NG, this is actually before. This is me with an NG tube. Uh, but you can see how emaciated I am. I think I, I showed this to illustrate how emaciated I, I was right. on the nutrition that, that they were giving me. Mm-hmm. Um, but at one point, I took my first steps. And this was about five months after my injury. Mm -hmm. And this was a huge deal. This is the first time I had put any weight on, or I had walked without a walker, you know, in months. And this is how I celebrated the seven year anniversary of my brain injury. (laughs) At Barton Springs. Got it. You got it. Brain <laughs> spring. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so let's see. What's what do I have next? So a lot went into my recovery. A whole lot. Mm-hmm. And at one point, I was, uh, you know, I was, I was steered towards a nutritional protocol, and I began to regain clarity, like I was saying. And I used that reading clarity and I started to study everything I could. Um, And I started to implement everything I could. And thank, I thank the internet so much. Actually my book, I thank the internet. (laughs) I just want to give a thank you to the resource that is the internet for, for providing the, ability for me to get the information I needed. I, I was able to read peer-reviewed research, connect with doctors all over the world, mm-hmm. and um, and it really, really powerful stuff. So uh, let's see. Uh, and then I, this is, this, yeah, this is important. This is neuronal migration. This is how neurons grow and synapse with each other. So showing neurons growing in synapsing with each other. And this is the basis of neural rehabilitation. It requires the supplies. So as I was saying, that was a huge bit. But the other thing is, is doing practices on my own. Um, yeah. And so when you, so were, when you were discharged and were involved with speech and language therapy, what was the focus at that stage? What were you working so, on? All right, let's, you know what? I can get out of here and stop sharing my screen. Yeah, so, so ask the question again. Yeah, so when you, um, 
when you were discharged and, and back home and you were receiving speech therapy, what were you working on kind of at that stage? So at that, at that stage, so I didn't have speech therapy for a little bit. Okay. And I was, I was looking up things that I could do. My mom and I were both looking for things I could do. And I remember she, she came to my room and she had a, a few like easy sentences for me to read, you know? And, and I was like, this is dumb. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and I actually really, music changed my life. Like music, I, I'm, I was a musician before my injury, which, um, which really lent a lot to my recovery. Uh, because as a musician, you understand um, the, the the process of learning, and really, we all we all understand the process of learning to a point, right? But uh, there are studies that show musicians' brains being more more uh, fibers in the corpus callosum and things of that sort, um, and it being more networked uh, within. So. So musicianship is great. And when I, um, I, I, you know, as I said, my left wrist was totally flexing inward and I used to play guitar and I couldn't talk and I couldn't lift my wrist enough. But as, as soon as I could, I, I worked to lift my wrist. And as soon as I could lift it enough to wrap it around a guitar, that's what I did. Yeah. And I had the throat surgery and I could talk. And as soon as I could talk, I tried to sing. And singing is so powerful for for our brains, for our hearts, for our, you know, for our pharynx, for our larynx, <laughs> all of it. It's it's really powerful. And and yeah, for our brain, it stimulates the vagus nerve, which stimulates which which innervates all of our autonomic function. So singing is really powerful. Gargling as well. Mm -hmm. is a really powerful tool that that speech language pathologists can use. And and was singing ever used in speech therapy with you? Like did your speech therapist ever try and use music as a tool? Um, yeah. And what did that yeah. look like? Later later on as I was playing playing guitar and uh, and singing Catherine Hayes again, I would I would bring my guitar there mm -hmm. and we would work on songs. Um, with, with, with clients, I, I have them sing songs that they, they enjoy. Oh, and the other thing was sing in the shower. And this was actually my functional neurologist suggested to sing in the shower. And he's like, and sing loud, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily in the shower, but the shower was like a place that, that felt like pretty natural place for people to be singing. Right. <laughs> So, yeah. so singing in the car, singing in the shower, or whatever, singing loud, and it's not something that that um, happens too much with speech language, speech language pathology traditionally, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a very powerful practice. Okay, but but your speech pathologist did, in some ways, incorporate music. It sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I I was like, I want to want to incorporate music, and she's yeah. like, bring your guitar. And so, so we, we did that. Okay. And I, I mean, she had her own office and her own building and whatnot. Um, so she could have me be loud. Um, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think that, that like, if you can or incorporate music, that's awesome. And one of the greatest parts of utilizing music is that it motivated me. Mm -hmm. Music was a huge motivator for me. And so, so finding what motivates people is mm -hmm. so huge, right? Um, and and really getting to know them. And I was actually talking to to my my partner uh, today um, about how I used to use beatboxing as as therapy as well because I used to, you know, I had, I had friends that were that would would rap and and I would do beat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um and that right there like doing things like that i mean she was like i don't even know what beatboxing is and some people don't know what beatboxing is 
But if beatboxing is something that motivates somebody, it's like, yeah, do that. Yeah. Um, that use use your mouth to make noises, to make sounds. And I ended up slow. So so I I, I will say that throughout my recovery, pe- people would mistake me for being drunk, as as I yeah, said earlier. Tell, tell me some more about that, and and tell me kind of how that how that was perceived in the world and any, any strange interactions you had. And then also, um, what were there any techniques that were used in therapy to, to try and work on any of that? Again, how much time do you have? <laughs> so yeah, no, but, but honestly, like when it comes to stories, I have some great stories that I could tell, <laughs> but it's, it's going to take a little bit. Um, one just just people thinking that i'm intoxicated and, and of course like slurring mm-hmm. and uh um, or or really slow speech because i learned i learned to instead of slurring to slow down my rate of speech so that i could enunciate each syllable and this is what i i work with my clients to do because if you can enunciate well um uh, w- w- in martial arts i was taught slow is smooth and smooth is fast so we would work on things very slowly i'd, I'd work on doing a sidekick like super slow and then bring it back and then i could be like bam snap it out super <laughs> easy because all of the neural pathways have been built to to you know the 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 brain and the periphery had, had really solidified those neural pathways to where it could just do it. And actually they call it central pattern generation. When you, when you generate a, a pattern in your, in your brain and peripheral system, so it just has to send one signal and your body does the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that that takes some time. So yeah, so I have slowed down the rate of speech. I still speak slower. I know that, mm-hmm. um, and I I still get mistaken for being intoxicated sometimes. Okay. Um, it's gotten better since I have a service dog, and people are like, oh, there's some going on. But but you know, I I look pretty recovered. Plus, you know, I walk around wearing a leather jacket and like. <laughs> You know, I, uh, I, I, I used to be a bartender and I, I fit the profile for somebody who's drunk, right? <laughs> um, so, so you see somebody in their, you know, mid, late thirties stumbling around and slurring the words, you know, like, hmm, he probably had a severe traumatic brain injury and survived against all odds and recovered beyond anybody's expectations. And now the artifact is that he's, he looks a little intoxicated. Yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind, right? Do you ever, along those lines, do you ever, in certain situations, um, self-disclose that information to someone? So let's say if you're at a event or something and you get the feeling that someone is maybe perceiving the slurred speech or something have you ever self-disclosed or do you wait for someone to to ask something i i used to i used to make it like a a, like big point like i'm not drunk this is what's going on you know and uh, I, i know it seems this way i actually have this and was really really forward with it and like and like then it just became the topic of conversation. I see. And it was just like, I want to talk about other things. Other you know, things, I wanna, yeah. I want to live a life that's not just my story. Right. All the time. And then what happened? Then what are you doing? And so <laughs> I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't say it right off the bat anymore. And I've honestly I've recovered to a point where I don't need to as right. much. Right, Um and 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 honestly, having a service dog, people people are like just are like something's going on. All right, cool. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, it's understood. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's it's but it's interesting. The perception of people uh, 
it, it really it, it's it, it was so upsetting to me for a long time that people would just think I'm stupid, think I'm um, drunk, think I'm, you know, high, whatever. They they think I was everything but what I was. Yeah. And it used to bother me. And uh, somebody somebody once told me, you know, what other people think about me is none of my business. And I love that. <laughs> That's pretty great. It's good. It's good. Um, it's a good way to kind of let that roll off your back, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so we've talked a bit about uh, the swallowing aspect. We've talked a bit about um, the ataxia of speech and kind of how that was targeted in therapy and the music. And I, I really like that takeaway of finding things that motivate people because. You know, as clinicians, we are trained to always put the person first. And so it really should be goals that you're interested in and using things that motivate you in therapy. It sounds like your speech therapist after the hospital definitely did that, found ways to incorporate things that were motivating to you. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you, you mentioned earlier in our discussion that um, you felt like your speech pathologist focused a lot on this cognitive rehabilitation side of things. What were the things that um, you guys worked on and what, what were the things you were noticing were um, hard for you as you were recovering in, in terms of cognition? Hmm. Uh, there was a lot of things. And honestly, I, uh, I, have done so much cognitive stuff that it's it's hard like certain things aren't really coming to mind sure um sure, in, sure. In, i can tell you some things that i use with my clients which um which actually so i i i use an app that i find very useful mm -hmm. um it's called elevate and it's free cognitive uh, exercises um and it's not super easy. This is, it's it's a bit more advanced. Mm -hmm. However, what it, it it also sends reports of like how you've done it, uh, how you're doing with it, and um, and my clients just send me screenshots of uh, of how they did on on each one of them. So, a I get to see that they did it for that day, and I get to see their results. You know, um, so but I know. I would recognize a lot of different things. And, um, and there's another thing about like looking at a screen is, is harder on our neurology than, than doing it pen and paper. And I, I wish I could remember some of the, um, some of the tests and things that were done. Yeah. Did but, you notice, um, I'm just curious cause not everyone has the same, obviously the same kind of, set of, of differences that emerges after a brain injury. Did you notice any changes in your attention or memory? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, attention, very, very easily distracted. Okay. Uh, and I mean, early after a brain injury, there's a lot of neuroinflammation. There's a lot of honestly neurodegeneration happening so it's very much it's very much a state where where the input you're getting is um you're less able to use at least i was less able to use my frontal lobes to a regulate my limbic system um which is you know very emotional and very reactive instead of responsive. Mm -hmm. So so something would happen that would push my buttons and I would I would react with like with snapping back in some way, shape or form. And um working on controlling my frontal lobe to actually, you know, integrate with my limbic system. And I have a very unconventional a uh, tool for this that I use with my with my clients that I have found very useful. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so neurological, uh, what's the word I'm going, principle. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is uh, Hebb's postulate, which is that neurons that fire together wire together. And so that's, and it's so true. Like when we fire, when we, so, so the idea with, with this strategy is, is my frontal lobe and my limbic system aren't talking very well. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll get all, something will come, it'll hit my limbic system and my frontal lobe won't get the relay before reacting. It'll just go straight to action. And what I wanted to do was go to my frontal lobe, let me go, hmm, how should I respond? And then send the action, right? So because neurons are fired together, wired together, we need something that stimulates the limbic system and then a way to override that. So we do some things in functional neurology where, where it's, uh, we call them um, antipsychotics, where basically you see a visual stimulus on this side and you go this way. Even though the stimulus is over here, you look at the dot over here. But let's take that a bit further also. And this, this is, when you get, when you hit, all right, imagine, getting splashed with cold water, right? Your limbic system goes, ah! <laughs> and so, so cold showers. I thought, and like, let's, let's just turn on the cold shower. And everything inside of me is like, get out of here. You know, like my limbic system is firing. And, um, and all right, take a deep breath. Instead of instead of turning on, going to hot and getting out, take a deep breath and know that you're okay. It's mm-hmm. just cold water. It's not going to kill you. You're going to be fine. You're safe. And now your frontal lobe is telling your limbic system that it's okay, that it can not do what it's programmed to do. And that practice um, has been extremely, extremely valuable. Um, doing that, uh, I, I, I used to even do it where I walk straight into a cold shower, which is, which is like, <laughs> high level. You're, you're, you're going high level with that one. But, uh, but it, it really helped to, to get used to something coming that, that absolutely hits the limbic system to let it pass to use your frontal lobes and strengthen that ability. And what, what happens with, uh, with clients is a lot of times they can then regulate those aspects as well. And there are other practices. I mean, knowing where you are in space and time is so powerful as well, because when we, when you don't know where you are in space and time, like you can't really be comfortable with, with, yeah, you can't really be comfortable, period, um, because you don't know where you are. And so helping people to uh, build those neural connections. And I, I use things like vibration platforms um, because that's sending more information from your peripheral nervous system to your brain um, and building those connections. I use things like... Uh, like like exercise simple things like exercising and using your whole body and um actually something that was really valuable was yoga first and then moved from yoga to jujitsu which is which is resistance with another human you know Mm -hmm. and um and obviously those are high level um things that were really yeah those are like moving forward but yoga is something that that people can do mm-hmm. and and uh and yoga is just such a such powerful practice i agree i'm gonna focus in now if it's okay since we're kind of at the oh. hour mark on a few remaining questions um yeah. if, if that's okay with you um absolutely okay so one of the questions that was asked um and this came up a few times is whether or not you notice still any symptoms from your brain injury initially, um, what those are, and if you're receiving any kind of maintenance therapy at this point for those symptoms, 
obviously you're extremely well versed and it sounds like you've got a lot in your own toolbox that you've put together. And so it may be the case that that's kind of what you're doing, but just curious to kind of hear about that. Yeah. Um, so I already showed you the, uh, mm -hmm. the cerebellum aspect. That's definitely an artifact and it's, <coughs> that also, um, goes to my my leg and okay. my old left side is uncoordinated so i'm i'm working on on running and i i i just i like doing my own therapy understanding how the the brain learns and understanding neurology has been extremely yeah. powerful for me i mean i i, I read many peer-reviewed uh, studies and mm -hmm. look through the research and learn a lot and then i'm going to neurology conferences i'm speaking in neurology conferences um and so it's all and i know a lot of people that are are doing these these practices that are giving me tips and things like sure. that um and so some of the uh some of the aspects that that i'm that um some other artifacts is that my swallowing mechanism it's still not great. So I tend to aspirate okay. um, sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. I need to tuck my chin in okay. order to swallow still to this day. Okay. And nobody really notices. Well, maybe, maybe you did when I was sipping coffee, <laughs> I bring my, like I don't bring my head up and sure. swallow or anything. That's, uh, and, and even holding my chin straight is, is hard for me. I, sure. I practice with, uh, I practice with water sometimes, but honestly, it's not that big a deal to me. Um, there's there's more important things for me to work on. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so swallowing is an aspect that's that's still an artifact, but it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, other artifacts: uh, attention and visual. Visual. Um, they're definitely visual artifacts. Like I still have double vision, okay. um, which is why I wear glasses. I didn't used to wear glasses. Um, sorry, the sun's sun's no problem. getting no problem. It looks kind of cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. And then um, you, said, you said some attention as well. You mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, attention as well. Um, I've been I've been working a lot on honing my focus. I mean, sometimes my focus is like nothing will distract me at all, and sometimes it's like, look, a bird, <laughs> like <laughs> it's a girl. Like, um, it's kind of both. Uh, the other thing is um, awareness of everything around me okay. um, and it's it's hard especially when I'm walking like it's great when I'm sitting down and my cerebellum isn't isn't working really hard but when I, when I'm walking for example I have trouble looking different directions like I can't really like scan the area as well okay. as, uh, as I used to um, so so that it, that's something I'm working on as well um, and I'm I'm doing things like walking on a treadmill and turning my head um you know where there's handles so if something like right. I fall a little bit i can catch myself and mm -hmm. looking up down i'm also using a vibration platform and um vibration platforms are awesome uh i i'm, I'm gonna be interviewing uh joel from from life pro uh feedabrain.com forward slash life pro that's where the interview will be. Um, okay. Either that or feedabrain.com forward slash rumblex. Either one will take you to the same place because I use uh, a vibration platform called the rumblex, which is, I mean, they have vibration platforms that are like thousands of dollars and this is like a couple hundred dollars and it's, it's awesome. So I'll stand on the vibration platform and I'll work on things like closing my eyes, looking left, looking right, looking down, looking up um kneeling down doing some translation with it and basically challenging my vestibular system while i'm getting a lot of peripheral input right neurons that fire together wire together so if we're getting that that input and and i'm 
stimulating my vestibular system, it begins to really see where I am in space and time and building those connections. Um, yeah, and so, I, I'm even doing, go ahead. Oh, so it sounds like mainly the, the changes with like vision and um, the ataxia are what's remaining. A little bit of stuff with attention you mentioned. Is that, do you feel like that's pretty much covered what's, what's left in terms of recovery for you? You might want to ask my partner. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I walk right now, but uh, but yeah, I, I I yeah, I'm sure I have blind spots. We all do. We all do, of course. And I'm sure I have more blind spots than most people. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's. That's all I can think okay. of right now. Another question that was asked was, um, you know, they noted that you made, you've made such a spectacular recovery, um, but other folks, depending on, on their brain injuries, may have a much slower moving or longer recovery. What advice would you give to um, traumatic brain injury survivors and their families who, who seem not to be recovering as quickly? Um, what advice would you give? Mm -hmm. First of all, I, I I felt the same way, and I I totally get that 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 feeling is is so valid, you know. Um, and I the 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 biggest thing is perseverance. Every day, do something working towards what you what you want to accomplish, you know. And be clear about what you want to accomplish. So, so for me, like looking forward, um, actually for, for, for clients, for all sorts of things, looking forward and not looking back. You know, you can measure the progress you've made by looking back. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, but, but you cannot measure looking forward it's That's like really trying to, yeah try it's like trying to figure out like how far is the horizon all right let's let's keep on walking it's <laughs> over there somewhere trying to catch up with the horizon you're never going to make it because you can't you can't see how far you've gone there if you're if you're trying to measure forward so so look forward measure backwards mm -hmm. that's really great advice thank you we're wondering if um if you, at any stage, and this probably sounds like it would be more like Catherine would have been the person to have done this, but if your SLP ever provided any level of counseling surrounding the brain injury or communication, um, and what advice you could give to us as future clinicians about how to count, counsel people with um, TBI, what are the sorts of things that you would have found useful or, or did find useful? That's so good because yeah, uh, my 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 speech language pathologist uh, Catherine Hayes was more of a, a yeah I don't I don't know psychologist in a lot of ways you know um, there was a lot of things that we would talk about there was a lot of trust built um, and it was um, a lot of um, emotional, like moving through emotional aspects mm. of, uh, of life <laughs> with, yeah. with the brain injury. Um, and I guess the biggest thing is seeing people, mm. helping people be seen. Um, I, there, you know, I was recently talking about this, um, Dan Poltz, who, uh, who, I met when I had my brain scanned with high definition fiber oh, tracking, okay. which I showed you at the beginning. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I met him there and he, he works with veterans with brain injury um, at the university of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah. You pit. And, um, and he taught me this. He taught me that everybody wants to be valued understood, accepted, loved, 
and trusted. Vault. B A U L T. Okay. Valued, accepted, understood, loved, trusted. And that is so true. So if you can help people feel valued, feel accepted, feel understood, or feel like you're trying to understand, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, because under being understood takes, takes, you know, a receiver and a transmitter, you Absolutely. know, both can be doing but, but you're trying to understand them um, loved and trusted. Like that, that, that is all so powerful. And that's what, what being seen is. Yeah. That's great. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And then a, a final kind of question. Um, was there a particular community resource, whether it be a single person, a, a, a provider of some kind, a service or a place that was the most helpful to you and your family during the recovery process? Absolutely. Charlene Crump at the Mary Lee Foundation um, in Austin. Mary Lee Foundation really, really just yeah thank you charlene and and thank you chip howe rest in peace um who was the admissions coordinator who brought me in um the mary lee foundation really is is uh provides a lot for people um and and you know like any facility there's a lot to be uh to be improved upon and there's but there's so much good there so yeah huge props to the mary lee foundation they made a huge difference okay great and then if there's anything that you feel like we have not touched on that you'd like to share with the class i know we we talked about a lot of different things today and thank you so much for sharing so much of your expertise and all of the things that are working for you like you said that maybe are not currently part of the kind of medical model and offered at a wide scale that's really helpful for for us to hear about. And um, of course, the class will go to your your blog and we'll have access to different videos that I know you you post um, incrementally with with different invited speakers. But is there anything else that you'd like to just share um, with us that you think is important that we didn't get a chance to touch on? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I'm I'm definitely going to take this video and I'm going to put it on my on uh, on my blog. So adventuresinbraininjury.com or feedofbrain.com. I think I'll do feedofbrain.com forward slash SLP, and I'm going to put all sorts of different resources there um, that that I have found helpful. Um, I want to build up. I I absolutely love working with practitioners and especially students because y'all are the future of medicine you know <laughs> and and that's what i i'm i'm all about evolving medicine this is uh this is a passion of mine and i love working with people who who are also share a similar passion and um and i think you all do and that's the reason you're becoming speech language pathologists there's there's a lot of of care and compassion with that so yeah, I'll, I'll create something at, at uh, feedofbrain.com forward slash SLP and adventuresinbraininjury.com forward slash SLP. Um, and there's, there's going to be lots of, I'll, I'll keep bringing resources. I'll put some videos there and, um, and I'd love to keep a conversation going. Yes, with you guys. So you, can, you can also find me on uh, Facebook, uh, Kevin Ballister or adventures in brain injury page or the feet of brain page um those are those are my two companies right now great and uh and yeah and if you um and as far as empowered neuro rehabilitation that's that's what i'm what i'm doing a lot with clients and um i'd love to chat with you guys more about that Thank you so 